to ask for the next speaker, please. So our next speaker is Dr. Andrea Della More de Padua, who will talk about bronchoesophageal fistulas. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, thank you for the kind invitation. So, bronchoesophageal fistula are fistulas are a very rare condition. Uh, could be classified generally in in three main groups. The first is the congenital one that we said before, and but we must keep in mind that sometimes bronchoesophageal fistula can become symptomatic even in the adulthood. The second largest group are the malignant fistula generally related with esophageal cancer, lung cancer, metastatic adenopathy, lymphoma, or whatever. And the third rarest group uh, are the benign bronchoesophageal fistula that can be inflammatory, for example, during tuberculosis, uh, histoplasmosis, silicosis, and other granulomatous disease, or can be post-surgically, generally after esophagectomy with the intrathoracic esophagogastric anastomosis. That will be the topic of the next presentation, so I move on. Then there are some very rare uh, etiology, like a caustic injection, trauma, after lung transplantation, and whatever. The diagnostic workup in case of bronchoesophageal fistula sometimes is very challenging, more than in the case of tracheosophageal one. Generally, a chronic cough worsens or not with a shallowing or postural change. Um, recurrent respiratory infection and hemoptysis are typical signs of small long-standing bronchoesophageal fistula. Um, in this patient, the, the diagnostic delay is very frequent and also a differential diagnosis with the other kind of uh, thoracic pathology is sometimes difficult. About the diagnostic tool, usually a bronchoscopy and esophagoscopy, but the more sensitive and specific is a barium shallowing, esophagography. A thoracic imaging with a CT scan is very important, not only to study the fistula tract, but also to evaluate the lung parenchyma and to plan surgery, of course. About malignant fistula, we know that um, more, more, about 5% of patients with esophageal malignancy and more or less 1% of patients with bronchogenic carcinoma will develop a, a, a bronchoesophageal fistula during their clinical history. We know also that when BEF becomes symptomatic, the, the, the clinical course of that patient getting worse rapidly with the survival range about one to three months. And we know that in the 40, up to 40 to 50% of the cases, the uh, respiratory involvement is at the level of one of the main bronchi. So what can we do in patients with malignant fistula to try to improve their survival or at least their quality of life? If we look at this whole Bastille representative paper, we can see that the prognosis of the patient is not influenced by the location of the fistula, by the type of the tumor. But nevertheless, if just we support the patient to their end of life, their clinical history is faster and worse uh, compared in patient in which we try to do some kind of palliative therapy. Of course, uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy can give um, a benefit, uh, but in uh, some very selected and fit patients, uh, also palliative surgical bypass can improve survival. That's mainly for two reasons. First, a better feeding and better nutritional support, and then because preventing uh, pulmonary infection. Indeed, we know that the main cause of death in this patient are sepsis, uh, secondary to pulmonary infection, more than the cancer itself. Obviously, surgery, palliative surgery, is not for all patients, actually just for a few patients. So the best, the, the preferred palliative methods is esophageal intubation with the covered self-expandable metal stand, as recommended also by the European um, Society for Endoscopy. But even with this minimally invasive approach, um, uh, um, complication is not 30% and the mortality is about 12%. About benign fistula, uh, congenital BEF can become event also in adult, in adult, as I said before. The first report comes from the 1965 by Brainbridge, who classified this kind of fistula in four types. Type 2, simple fistula, is the more frequent. We have some diagnostic criteria that include no evidence of inflammation around the fistula tract or the esophagus, no other and inflows. But what is really important is the histological demonstration of the presence of an epithelium mucosa muscularis mucosa in the neck of the fistula. 
Why this fistula became symptomatic in the adulthood usually is related to the diameter of the fistula that generally are very small, like a pinhole. It runs upwards, so it may close during sh uh, shallowing. Sometimes uh, there is a membrane or uh, the fistula can arise in the fold of um, um, mucosa of the esophagus. Anyway, in uh, all this case, surgical uh, correction is always indicated, getting very good results. About benign bronchiesophageal fistula, we know that endoscopy is not the first choice treatment. Uh, should be reserved just for patients with very most fistula or not fit for surgery or the step before surgery. Uh, today we have different technique uh, and, um, uh, and device, uh, fully covered except expandable metal stand, silicone stand, endoclips, uh, um, uh, surgical glue, coagulation. In this recent paper, you can see that the successful rate of an endoscopic closure of benign fistula is about 46%. They report 10 failure, and among these patients, five underwent following surgery. But what is really disappointing is that the uh, mortality in failed patients is about 60%. So definitely, the endoscopic treatment is not the first choice in case of benign bronchiesophageal fistula. About surgery, there are not a lot of uh, series reported in literature. This is the group from Matizen and Grillo, who reported in 2002 13 patients with adult benign death from different etiology. A patient underwent surgery through a trochotomy approach, fistula division, direct uh, suture of the bronchial, double layer suture of the esophagus, and always interposition with some kind of viable tissue. Using this technique, they report only one surgical fail. In 2007, the group of Kim reported 14 patients with adult benign fistula, mainly related to tuberculosis infection or esophageal traction diverticular. What is really interesting in this area is the high number of associated lobectomy, almost 43% of the case. The author concludes that a low threshold to perform a lobectomy in this area can explain the very good result because prevent uh, uh, postoperative pneumonia and uh, long-term complication related to the chronically the major clan globe. I don't know. In the 2010, the group of the Mayo Cleaning Groups reported the experience in respiratory esophagus fistula, 14 cases were bronchiesophageal one, nine on the right, five on the left. What is interesting is that the, only the size of the fistula was associated with the risk of reoperation. Very recently, this group reported 22 patients with very complex tracheoesophageal or bronchoesophageal 14 patient fistula in which the, the, the standard procedures and the direct shelter of the fistula was not feasible and they use extra thoracic muscle flap as a patch to repair very huge loss of tissue. They have very good results, hardware healing achieved in the 95% of the case. And of course, there's, in this kind of, of com very complicated patient, the mortality was about 80%. Our group from Padua in the 2009 published the first case of the repair of bronchoesophageal fistula with a synthetic bioabsorbable material that was vicarious mesh. In this case, the patient had a two centimeter fistula between the right main bronchus and the gastric tube after an eye-volus operation. The patient survived the two operation and after two months, the endoscopy control showed a complete reepitalization of the patch. That's today is our experience in nine patients with a challenging tracheal or bronchiesophageal fistula treated with a bioabsorbable synthetic patch. Post-intubation injury was the most common etiology. We use a gore bio a tissue patch in six patients and a vicral knit and mesh in three, always in combination with muscle flap interposition. We had one post-operative death related to a cerebral event, and we demonstrated endoscopically during the follow-up airway healing obtained in eight patients. This is a one intraoperative pictures in which you can see the, gyro bi the gore bio hay pads uh, sutured in a continuous fa fashion with PDS 4O on the right main bronchus. And that's some early and late post, uh, post operative um, aspect uh, endoscopic view of the, um, of, um, of the repair. Uh, we got biopsy of the tissue surrounding uh, the patch and we demonstrated neoformate epithelium. So in conclusion, I can say that the benign bronchiesophageal fistula, the surgical treatment, is a treatment of choice. The standard procedure, the, the gold standard procedure, consists in fistula division through trochotomy, primary closure of the bronchus, uh, double layer suture of the esophagus, and interposition of some kind of viable tissue. 
Muscle flap can be used not only for the interposition between the suture line, but in case of very huge fistula, in, uh, can be used also as a patch for either repair of the gastrointestinal tract and the airways. A biabsorbable patch could be used as, a, as a, an alternative technique to repair large fistula when under standard procedure cannot be used or are too risky. These patches are enough rigid to support ventilation and uh, act as a scaffold for epithelial co colonization. The use of interposed muscle flap is mandatory to provide good blood supply to support the posterior ward neoformed airway and, of course, to reduce the infection risk. Thank you very much for your attention.